to be here again today. <coughs> I want to take your thoughts today to uh, a text in the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John chapter 12. John chapter 12. <coughs> I've entitled a sermon, Do They See Jesus? Do They See Jesus? John chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 20, and if you want to follow it through in the translation you have, well, that's good. And we read, And there were certain Greeks amongst them that came up to worship at the feast. Perhaps I should explain that these Greeks were not necessarily people who came from Greek, from Greece. These were people who had, uh, had uh, come from some outlying place outside of the uh, country of Palestine and could have come from Greece, but they could have come from uh, Italy or from many other areas and had chosen to be identified with the Jewish people. Um, they, uh, we would call them proselytes, I suppose, today, but uh, <coughs> that's a funny word, but the New Testament writers used the word Greeks to mean that they were not typically Jewish people. They'd come to associate with the Jewish people and joined with them often in their worship. So there were a certain number of them who came to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. You see, they came to someone who uh, was probably of the same ethnicity as themselves, because Philip is a Greek name, it's not a Hebrew name. And they saw Philip and they thought, well, here's someone who is just like us, pretty much like us. He's the kind of fellow to talk to. These people must have been a little bit shy, a little bit cautious about <coughs> approaching Jesus. And, of course, it was the polite thing to ask someone to introduce them. It's a bit like the old English idea, you don't speak until you've been introduced. Well, they weren't quite as bad back there, but uh, they did have this kind of politeness, that to meet a great teacher, someone whom you revered in some way or another, required that you were introduced by someone who knew them. So these men were very polite, and I presume they were men. They came to Philip and they said, uh, Philip, uh, uh, we, are, we are of the same ethnicity and uh, so on, and... Uh, we uh, would like to see Jesus. We'd like an interview with Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and by the way, Andrew is not a Hebrew name either. So Philip and Andrew were probably not Jews. They, if they were, they had been brought up at some stage in uh, some area where uh, they had been under Greek influence. Perhaps they had uh, Greek or uh, Italian or some other kind of nationality in their heritage. Perhaps their fathers were very likely so. So Philip and Andrew seemed to be the right people to come and approach Jesus. And uh, so uh, Andrew says, um, and Andrew and Philip together they went and they told Jesus that there were some men from some other foreign place who had come to town to worship but they would like to be introduced to him. And uh, Jesus didn't disappoint them. Jesus never disappoints anyone who wants to be introduced to him. <clears throat> the setting is, of course, that uh, Jesus is in his last week of ministry before he's to be crucified. Mary had anointed his uh, feet with oil on that Saturday night <coughs> prior to the crucifixion, and uh, it seems that uh, the feast at Simon's house was the great opportunity for Jesus to teach some little, uh, little lessons there and to reassure, uh, reaffirm uh, what he had been trying to say, that he would soon be killed and he would be buried and that Mary had demonstrated her faith and confidence in him by bringing this precious ointment, which could have been sold for 300 pence, we are told. That's 300 days' wages. That's a year's work. <clears throat> and uh, she must have saved hard to do this special thing. It almost seems as though Mary was the only one who really understood what was going to happen to Jesus. The disciples didn't want to see him crucified and so they put it out of their mind, they blanked it out. Simon was just learning 
<coughs> this particular Simon was just learning, and uh, the Mary here seems to have known, and she thought, the only thing that I can do for Jesus is to show him that I love him. And so she was the first to bring a token of her love and appreciation to Jesus. Well, it seems as though the next day, which would have been the Sunday, first day of the week, <coughs> a lot of people were gathered together to come to the feast because uh, the feast of the Passover was coming up soon. And uh, they were gathering together around Jerusalem and uh, they saw Jesus there. And when they saw Jesus there, they were so excited that Jesus was there. They said, this is the Passover where we make Jesus king. Um, he had healed their sick, <coughs> sick and he had restored uh, many there who had uh, injury. And, uh, <coughs> and he had preached them and taught them about a kingdom that uh, he was going to set up. And so they rushed out with the palm branches and uh, laid their clothes on the pathway as he went towards the temple. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem, <coughs> there that day the people thought that they were going to make him king. But Jesus saw that the movement was getting a bit too uh, forceful and uh, he got himself out of the road and he didn't want to be made king there. They were very excited because of the fact that Lazarus was also in the crowd. And Jesus had not so long before raised Lazarus from the dead. And he attracted a lot of attention. And uh, <clears throat> so Jesus thought this is not a good place to be for too long. So he moved out of there because Jesus was not going to be a king who ruled from a throne in Jerusalem. Jesus is a greater king than that. Jesus is not a king who's going to just rule in any sort of a throne. Jesus is a king who's going to rule from heaven. And uh, Jesus didn't want them to get any wrong ideas. And so these men who came from this far, uh, foreign uh, place thought, we need to talk to Jesus. We need an introduction to Jesus. We want to know what Jesus is all about. <coughs> the request for an interview was granted by Jesus. And uh, Jesus emphasized a few significant things uh, about his, uh, his mission. This is one of Jesus' shortest sermons. He didn't have a lot of time to get a message across to these men but Jesus knew if they could accept the message that he had for them, they could take it to uh, their part of the world and uh, they would be ambassadors for him. <coughs> Notice that uh, in verse 23, Jesus says, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified that Jesus would become the centre of attention uh, in a positive way. This is what this term glorified means. It doesn't mean that he would be uh, made in, into some great spectacular angelic uh, visions, but uh, it's, uh, he, uh, we could use the word honoured. The time has come when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, he's referring to himself, will be honoured. Surely I say to you, he says, <laughs> Except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it stays alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Jesus was trying to get a message across to these people. He's trying to tell them that something is going to happen that is related to death. Of course, it was his own death that he was referring to. And Jesus uses this little illustration that uh, he is going to have to die in order that a great number of people could be called the fruit of his labour. Nobody has, plick, has picked anything from a tree or dug anything from the garden unless someone first has planted a seed. Johnny Appleseed went all across some part of uh, America years ago, so tradition has it anyway. I don't know how true it is. And everywhere he went, he dropped apple seeds. And apparently the Granny Smith apple is a result of that. I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, there's no apple tree unless a seed is planted. There is no harvest of the church unless Jesus is dead 
and buried. He is trying to tell them that someone has to make the sacrifice in order to reap the harvest. Someone has to do the dirty work in order to get that pleasant part of the job, the harvest. And these people understood the lingo. They knew what he was talking about. And so <coughs> he, uh, he then talks about uh, this selflessness. Verse 25, he that loves his life will lose it. And he that hates his life, that's an old word for meaning, he that puts his life in second place to other important things, hates his life in this world, will keep it unto eternal life. Jesus is saying that it calls for some self-sacrifice. You need to have a vision for something better in order to sacrifice what you already have now. And that's true of us today, isn't it? Usually if we want something better, there is a cost to pay. And that cost is to sacrifice something that we hold dear to here and now. If you want to buy a bigger farm, you might have to move out of the lovely, comfortable old farm cottage that you've been in for 20 years because you can't have a bigger farm unless you sell this one and go to the bigger one. If you want to have <coughs> a larger car, you've probably got to get rid of the Morris Minor and uh, you've loved it and you thought it was marvellous or you've got rid of the Mini because you thought it was lovely and you wanted to keep it forever like I had an old uh, Rambler an old uh, American Rambler, a lovely, comfortable old car. They haven't made cars comfortable ever since that Rambler. And uh, my Holden's not a patch on it for comfort. But in order to get a, a better car and something more modern and uh, something that's sort of qualified to get my uh, allowance and so on um, from, uh, from the conference, I had to one day say goodbye to my Rambler. There's a trade-off. To get something better, we have to get rid of something we have. This is the idea of selflessness. And the selflessness that Jesus was going to demonstrate at the crucifixion was a selflessness that you and I barely understand. We try to understand it, but it's very difficult to get to the depths of it. There is discipleship. Verse 26 says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honour. Discipleship. Discipleship requires the denial of yourself. The denial of your own ideas that have been embedded and implanted in the mind there for years and years. Perhaps by your parents, perhaps by your education perhaps by a result of your own study and reasoning and rationality. Discipleship requires that you dedicate your mind and thought and thinking and allow it to be moulded by the one whom you are following. And in order to be a Christian, one must follow Jesus Christ and allow their mind to be disciplined by him. I would say in this day and age we have less disciplined minds than in any other era of, church, of the uh, history of the church. And even within the church I see that people have very poorly disciplined minds. The reason? Because they're not as dedicated to Christ as the early Christian church was. Christ is not the last word on everything that they do. There is rationality, there is government policy, there is school policy... There is, uh, <coughs> there is the home economics policy. There's, uh, there's the person with all the education from university policy and all that sort of stuff that we take before we take the policy of Jesus Christ and before we become real disciples. We are in all sorts of different ideas and so on. A disciple is one who follows Jesus Christ, the teacher. This is what these men had to learn. There is submission... Verse 27, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Jesus says? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I came into this hour. Jesus is submitting himself to his heavenly Father's plan for him. Yes, it was a painful experience for Jesus. Yes, it was hard for him 
to face that last week of his life. He knew full well what was going to happen to him. He knew he was going to die a miserable death, rejected by all but a handful of people, rejected as someone who's not worthy of following, not worth having as a leader and as a teacher. He knew that even his own disciples would go and hide in the bushes rather than stand beside the cross on which he would die and bleed and suffer. He committed himself to God. Father, save me from this hour, he says. Is that what I should say, he says? No, he says, this is the cause I came into the world. Don't save me from it, Father. Don't save me from it. If this is what I'm supposed to do, don't save me from it. Submission to the will of God is pretty difficult even today, isn't it? Submission to the will of God, which cuts right across our whims and our fancies and our natural propensities, our habits and uh, our addictions. It's so hard to say, I will do the will of God. Let's look in verse 28 to 30 where it says, Father, glorify thy name. Jesus wanted some sort of token to offer these people who came to see him that what he was saying was really the words of God. And look what happened. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, honoured it, and I will honour it again. Now the people that stood by and heard it, they said, it thundered. Another said, an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said, this voice came not because of me, but it came for your sakes. Jesus wanted these people to hear something phenomenal that would convict them that what he was saying came from God. And it did. And those of them, them whose ears were attuned to what Jesus were talking, was talking about knew what it was about but others said, well, it's just some sort of a clap of thunder. And that's how it is still today, isn't it? There are people attuned to Jesus' words. And there are others who say it's about the equivalent of a clap of thunder. It gives you a fright. It scares the horses, but nothing else really happens. It all settles down. The black cloud goes away and the sun comes out again and nothing's really happened. <clears throat> confirmation that God is there is very important. Then Jesus says, if you look at me and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Jesus then says, you gentlemen from afar, you need to look at me. These men would have been filled with all sorts of ideas and philosophies and understandings of religious things. They would have had some influence of the, uh, the, the Jewish understanding and that of the Pharisees or the Sadducees. They would have had all sorts of mixed up ideas of where to look for the coming king and the ruler of their life and for eternity. But Jesus says, look at me. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Jesus is saying, you need to stop looking around at all these confusing things and look to me. I will become the object of your wonder. I will become the object for which you seek, from whom you seek knowledge and understanding. I will become the one whom you honour beyond any other being on earth. And if I'm lifted up from the earth, and they understood what that meant, because that was a term that was uh, referring to crucifixion. And every Jew knew what that meant because hundreds of Jews had been crucified. Um, <coughs> Romans weren't crucified, but hundreds of Jews were. And they knew that term, lifted up from the earth, meant crucifixion. And so Jesus was saying, if you watch my crucifixion, something will happen. <coughs> Something will happen. You will be drawn to me because you will see that I am fulfilling the role that, uh, <coughs> that I am to play 
in saving human beings. Jesus is saying, <clears throat> look to me. What did these men see when two humble disciples introduced them to Jesus? What did they see? What happens when we ask people to come and see Jesus in the year 2008? Rapidly approaching the year 2009, what happens when we ask people, or people ask us to show them Jesus? You can't take them by the hand or put them in your nice new car and drive them off to some big evangelistic meeting in Auckland or New York or in London or Jerusalem for that matter and say, there is Jesus. If you want to know about Jesus, there he is. We can't do that because Jesus is not here in person. Jesus is not preaching in Jerusalem <coughs> or in Tokyo. <coughs> pardon me, or Beijing, or, or, or in Wellington, or wherever. When people ask us, show me Jesus, where do we have to take them? It's a good experience when people ask you something about, show me Jesus. I've had two recent experiences that uh, were, were exciting to me. One was at the recent vacation Bible school over at Dargaville, and uh, while I was working there with the, the hobby class, um, showing kids, of all things, how to paint pretty pictures on tiles and bake them up so that you can use hot pots on them and so on and so forth, um, hoping that they are better artists than I am, and most of them were. Um, <clears throat> while working away there, I was hoping that I'd get into conversation with these kids a little bit and be able to give them something more than just sticky paint, painted fingers. And uh, one boy, uh, about 10 years old, um, said to me, we sing a song at VBS, and that song is, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And he said to me, can you tell me what's a lamb got to do with being redeemed? And what's this blood all about? I think he's been to three VBSs, he said. And every time they went to a vacation Bible school, they sing that song, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We sing it, don't we? And you know, 90% of the people that sing that song got no idea what it's on about. It's a good, catchy tune. And I thought to myself, I've got to explain to him somehow in the simplest of terms what the lamb's got to do with the blood and what the lamb's got to do with being redeemed. And so I explained to him in very simple terms the connection between the, uh, the sacrifices of lambs and how Jesus is, is uh, um, a lamb is used as a symbol of Jesus. A lamb is used in place of using the name Jesus all the time. They use the name lamb and Jesus is sometimes called a lamb uh, because he was the one who died. He was the one whose blood, <coughs> blood poured out and he lost his life, otherwise we would have to die. And in those few minutes I got something across to him and I saw his eyes light up and he said, now I understand what that song's about. He said, I never knew what it was all about. And I thought, what a marvellous opportunity. I wish I'd had a lot more time there. Listening to the conversation was a lady who has recently been attending the church at Dargaville. And, uh, and she was listening intently. I hope I was able to introduce them to Jesus in that simple way. The other occasion was uh, just last weekend, uh, I was talking with a, a uh, Spanish man who's a very accomplished scientist, and uh, <coughs> he asked me what I did, and I told him what I did, and uh, he found it hard to understand what a church minister is. Um, because he only knew of uh, Buddhists, um, sorry, of uh, Islamics and uh, of uh, Roman Catholic priests. He didn't know what a church minister was. He said, well, what's a church minister do? And so I said to him, well, um, um, you're Spanish. I presume you've come from a predominantly Roman Catholic uh, background and environment. He said, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, you know what a Catholic priest does? 
Yeah, he said a Catholic priest, uh, he says he puts bread on your tongue and he drinks, uh, drinks the wine at the church service. And I said, how much involvement have you had with the church? He said, none at all. He said, well, when I was a kid, I went along with my mother. He said, I was dragged along. That's all I know about it. And uh, so he said, what would, uh, what would happen um, if I went to, to your church? He said, well, first of all, he says, Is your, does your church recognise the Pope as the head of, of Christendom? And I said, no, we, we don't. I said, I recognise that for Roman Catholics, the Pope's the head of their church, but for us, um, the Pope is not the head of the church. He said, well, do you have something equivalent to the Pope? And I said, no, we don't. The, the head of our church is Jesus Christ. And he said, well, what would happen, he said, if I, uh, if I was to come to one of your meetings, he said, one of, into one of your churches, uh, what would be the difference between that and uh, any other church? Now, the temptation was to tell him that when he came into our church, he wouldn't see little icons and images and pictures around the wall. And I suddenly thought, that's not what our church is all about. Would it make any difference if there were pictures and little icons around the wall? Would that really make the difference? Would look different, but would it really make any difference? So I had to think rather quickly, and I thought to myself, would I tell him um, that, uh, <coughs> that our church um, meets on the real Sabbath? We meet on the real Sabbath. We keep God's commandment. We meet on the real Sabbath. And I thought, no, that's not the way to go either. And I had to think pretty quick because he was sort of waiting for an answer. And I said, well, there'd be several differences. But I said, um, I think the difference that you would see is that Jesus Christ is the only way by which we can get eternal life. Through Jesus Christ only, we don't have saints to help us. We don't have other good people to help us. We don't have Mary to help us. We don't need all of that because we have Jesus Christ. I said, yeah, it's true, you'd come to our church on Saturday, that's the original Sabbath day, it's true to be on Saturday, but I said, I think what you would notice is that Jesus Christ is upheld as the only way that we can escape this world and have eternal life. And just at that moment, somebody, and I have to sadly say it was my son, grabbed him by the arm and said, come on, we're going to play golf. And it was raining outside and he looked outside and anyway decided he'd go and play golf. And that was the end of my introduction to him, to Jesus. I hope maybe that I have opportunity again, perhaps or talk to him or our boy will have opportunity to talk to him. Maybe it's aroused something. And I thought to myself, when we have opportunity to introduce someone to Jesus, we have a moment or two in a short sermon, just a matter of minutes sometimes. What are we telling those people? What do inquirers see when they come to a Seventh-day Adventist situation? What do they see when they come to a Seventh-day Adventist home in 2008 and beyond? Do they find cleanliness and orderliness and standards of conduct? Do they see a Bible in that home? Do they see that Jesus is really the master of that home? Or do they see bickering and arguing and one-upmanship? Do they see so much hassle and hustle and bustle do they see that Jesus doesn't seem to be there really? What happens when they come to inquire about the Seventh-day Adventist marriage? Would they see Jesus in the marriage where there is love and respect? Where there's kindness and gentleness with his patience. If they only had 10 minutes with you and your spouse, what would they see? Would they see Jesus or would they see much of what they would see anywhere else in the world today? Arguing and bickering, nastiness, selfishness, 
What would they see if they were taken to your workplace? Would they see conscientiousness? Or would they see you clocking out at 10 too? Five, that is, not seven. Would they come to your workplace and say, this workplace is better because there is a Christian here? Or would they discover that this place, workplace is union-ridden, even by the Christians? What if they came to your business? Would they discover honesty and integrity and respect and concern for the customer? Or would they discover shrewdness and selfishness there? What if they were introduced and they came to, wanted to be introduced and they came to your home and to your bookshelf, or mine for that matter? Would they find wholesomeness there? Would they find Jesus in your bookshelf? Or would they find all sorts of novel nonsense that distracts the mind from those things which are good? The bookshelf today, of course, is more than just a book. The bookshelf today is in the form of DVD and, uh, and CD and all that sort of stuff. What would they find if they came to your TV set? What would they find coming across the TV, the entertainment centre of the house? Would they find recreation or recreation? What would they discover in a few minutes with your TV on in your lounge room or my TV on in my lounge room? Would they discover something that rebuilds their characters, that introduces them to Jesus, or would they find all this nonsense from Hollywood and Bollywood and wherever? Would they find Coronation Street the program that means that you rush home from work as quick as you can to get tea on quickly so you can whack the TV on and listen to the worst television program that's ever been produced in the world. There are more people influenced by that terrible TV program than any other program in the world. It's statistically so. And yet, unfortunately, Seventh-day Adventists, I know some of them who rush home to watch Coronation Street. If the devil was ever in any TV program as Coronation Street, because you know as well as I do that every evil that men have ever committed is portrayed in Coronation Street as normal life. And that's why it's so subtly evil. And if today I convince someone that they should never look at Coronation Street again, my sermon's been worthwhile. I use that as much as anything as a sample of many other programs that are on TV, but I use that particularly because it's gone on for 27 years, is it? And people love the evil that comes across in Coronation Street. Give it up, people. Give it up if you're into it. What would happen if people came to your computer? <clears throat> your computer. We've heard a lot about what's coming across on people's computers lately. What's lurking in that little wee chip in your computer? Would Jesus show up on your computer? Or would it be some useless, senseless game where people are running around murdering and killing each other and trying to gain some kind of dominance over others? Is that what would be in your computer or would it be something worse? It would it be something that the police would be interested in? Or should I say that some of the police are actually very interested in in a personal way? Would it be something that we call <coughs> obscenity, that we consider that we call porn? 
We hope that no one is introduced to Christianity through such a computer because they won't find it. What's to be found in the refrigerator? If someone was to be introduced in our homes via the refrigerator, I wonder what they would find. With all the knowledge that Seventh-day Adventists have been blessed to have in regard to what should be in your refrigerator, I fear that there will be things in the refrigerator that would deny that you are a disciple of Jesus. It's true, isn't it? It's true. After years and years and years of given the advice that we have been blessed to have been given, we still find Seventh-day Adventists of years standing with things in their refrigerator that deny that we are disciples of Jesus Christ and that we have denied the light that he has given us. We need to think about it. What about in the wardrobe? What do we find in the wardrobe? $500 pairs of shoes. 200 makes me blink at a pair of shoes. I'm glad the warehouse is around. You can buy them on sale for $30. But sometimes because of the size of your feet and the shape of them, you have to spend $150. But $1,000 is going way over the top, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Is extravagance. Is extravagance going to witness something about Jesus? The gold and the silver and the things that we hang on and around ourselves, does it witness to Jesus? What's in the garage? What's in the garage? How new's the Harley? How old's the Ferrari? And even if it happens to be a Holden, if it can't be afforded with the dollars and cents that come into the household and it's a burden to the household, it doesn't represent Jesus Christ. If all our money and time and affection is put into the things that, stand, that go in the garage there, and of course it might be the boat as well, and if it's taking our time and affection and our money and our tithe and our influence, then it shouldn't be there. We're not representing Jesus Christ. Finally, I want to say... As these men wanted to see Jesus, we would hope that they will find him at least in the church. And so when we bring them to the church to see Jesus, what do they find in the church? Do they find warmth in the church? Do they find truth in the church? Do they find unity in the church? Do they find humility in the church? Do they find support in the church? Do they find acceptance in the church? Do they find reverence for God in the church? Or do they come into the church and feel a chill? Not because the heaters weren't on, but a chill that just seems to pass from shoulder to shoulder. Do they find heresy in the church? Something that appears to be truth but is designed to lead people away from a true dedication to Christ. Do they find, unfortunately, schism in the church? Where the church is divided and one half of the church is here and the other half of the church is here. Or perhaps one half of the church is already gone. Do they find pride in the church? I'm much better than he. She's much better than her. Because of thus and so, would they find criticism in the church? They haven't done it right. They didn't do it according to the rules. They're not as good Christian as him. So and so did such and such. I would never do that. They could perhaps find rejection in the church. Rejection because they came into the church in a pair of old jeans and a tattered T-shirt and they didn't seem to be quite right for those people who were sitting in the church with a suit coat on and a tie. should have preached the sermon without one, shouldn't I? Would they come into the church and find commotion? 
No reverence. Everybody talking about everything that happened during the week and is going to happen next week and happened um, a couple of weeks ago or in the year in advance. People talking about their business, people uh, <coughs> uh, laughing and carrying on in a frivolous way. Would they find the church is no better than the mall or the marketplace? What did these men find when Philip and Andrew introduced them to Jesus? They found a saviour. And in every aspect of our lives as Christians, whether we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians or any other who takes the name of Christian, when someone wants to be introduced to Jesus, we must make sure that we present to them a saviour. A selfless saviour. A saviour who is fit to be called Lord and King. A saviour who is safe to follow and one would want to be a disciple of. A saviour who has the answer to this world's woes and more particularly your problems. The problems of those who want to seek something better. What sort of introducers are we? What do we take people to when they say, I want to see Jesus? Or perhaps we ourselves need to see Jesus. If you don't see Jesus, you won't recognise him and you won't be able to take anyone else there. If you need to see Jesus, take a look at Jesus the selfless sacrifice for our sins so that you and I can have what he alone deserves. I trust that as we think about introducing people to Jesus, we will think first about whether or not we ourselves know him. We don't want to introduce people to a stranger. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Jesus Paid It All. <clears throat> our loving Heavenly Father, as we leave this service today, we pray that we'll be more mindful of how we represent you to the world around us. We pray that our lives will be a living witness to what you can do and that people seeing us might see something of you and that we will be effective in leading people to come to know you. Dismiss us with the assurance of our own salvation today, we pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>